Hey everyone, how's it going? I'm going to be showing you how to do your own custom panel line scribing. The kit I'm working on here is a piece from Armored Core, manufactured by Kotobukiya. Uh, I've already finished scribing, painting, and top coating all the limbs and weaponry, except for now the core and the head and the waist. So I'm in the last leg of this, of finishing up this kit. Can't wait to show you guys what the end product looks like. You're joining me on the tail end of this of this build. I'm going to show you what I do for panel lining, what my process is like. I'll speed up through the boring bits and slow it down when I have some information to impart. The left side, you can see these are panel lines that I've already scribed. The chisels that I use are the BMC chisels by Suji Borido. My blue handle, I use my 0.125 and 0.2, as you can see, labeled. So the lines that you see here, <clears throat> the thin ones are 0.2 millimeters, and then the thick one there is the 0.4. Now I have yet to get the 0.5, but these will be my two medium width chisels. And so that's what that single notch right there, this one right here, that's the 0.4. And then for extra detailing, I actually use a pin vise. It implies that they're screw holes. I give these, there's another one right there, another one right there. I give these about 10 turns clockwise and then five turns counterclockwise to scoop out the extra material. Now, one thing to note when you scribe is that, and when you um, use the pin vise, is that it craters. You'll see here, that it collects on the, the ridge around the crater here, here as well. Looks sloppy. So in order to avoid getting paint collected on the craters and of the panel lines too, even these BMCs, it's not so bad on the BMC chisels, but it will raise the edges a little bit. And in order to smooth that out, we go over this, uh, you know, with sanding sticks. I've made a thick line right here, this one right here, and that's with the 0.7. Actually, I think this is the one millimeter. Yeah. Yeah. One millimeter, and then I think the 0.4 down here, along with the, the curvature of the, the piece already present, so that when I do fill this with panel line accent color later, and it'll pop a little bit more. I just want that. I want that implied part separation. Um, let me show you a piece. I finished the I finished the left leg here about a week ago. Pretty much everything you see here is my own panel lines. This was a bare piece of plastic that looked kind of like this before, right? Just blank, blank everywhere. So you can see the stark difference. I used varying widths. So right here, I'm a little bit newer with the thicker width chisels and each new width requires a slightly different touch. So it's a learning process every time you pick up a new width chisel. Here's the, the, the 0.7, another 0.4, which I'm getting used to. Uh, 0.7s are still messy. Scribing this leg, each part, the calf, the extra armor plating, the feet, by the way, underneath here, I did not do any of this. This is all raised detail that was present. I did not touch the bottom of the feet. Doing all of these cuts, sitting here with a blank piece of plastic and drawing. First, I did, this is the left leg. So I first did the right leg and sitting with that, for the first time you gotta come up with something original. So you sit there and you stare at the blank piece of plastic. Sometimes it can last. I don't know, hours, sitting there, staring, waiting for designs to appear on the plastic for you, right? So you got to dig deep in terms of um, coming up with creative designs. And then, of course, the painstaking process of drawing it, erasing it, drawing the lines that you like, keeping them, actually scribing them, and then seeing what new lines appear out of that one and going forward from there, drawing them, and then applying guiding tape, which we'll go over. By the way, this is high Q parts, H I Q parts guiding tape, three millimeter width, six millimeter width. I like the six millimeter more because it has more tacky surface area. So it sticks for longer. It can be reapplied more times and it's less of a liability because it doesn't shift when you use it, say as like a stop tape for your blade. 
three millimeter runs out of tackiness much faster for obvious reasons. So this took me two and a half weeks to take, not even from bare to painted, but from bare to scribed and polished and sanded. And I work on my model kits 40 hours a week. I treat it like a second job because I, I love it that much and I just want to see how far I can push myself since this is my first kit. I'm curious to see how, really to see how much I love it. And well, I've been going at it for about two and a half months now. I started beginning of May this year. So today's middle of July, about two and a half months. So panel lining takes roughly a hundred hours to come up with the original design and then scribe. Now I did the right leg first. Again, this is the left leg. So the right leg took a hundred hours. This leg oh, took much less time, roughly half, roughly half. A little bit less than half even because you don't have to come up with the designs. You just copy and paste. Here's the right leg, here's the left leg. In order to copy a design over, there, there's a number of different modelers on YouTube that you can that you can watch. The guy who really got me onto scribing or deciding that I wanted to scribe for my first model was uh, Robbie Pla. Yeah, watching him, oh, just watching him make his clean lines, lay the guiding tape, engraved so perfectly along the guiding tape. It's a beautiful thing. It's a real work of art. Oh, by the way, the chisels themselves too, the BMC chisels, these are also works of art in and of themselves. These chisels are so nice. And it's really, it's, it's quite lovely. Um, if you take a close look at the chisel, if you ever, you know, are blessed to have one, you can see where they're, yeah, you see that this dark, ooh, polished. It's sort of darkened towards the tip as well. They're really beautiful. So I've been using those for two months. Before I got those, I used the Tamiya Scriber 2, which is 10 bucks. <laughs> so, <clears throat> oh, I guess this is kind of turning into like a product review at the same time. So I'll do a, like a more formal review of the tools that I use in a separate shorter vid video, but since this is a tutorial, you need to know what I'm using. So for the first month, I use this piece of shit. Excuse the language. Plastic Scriber 2 with spare blades to Mia. 10 bucks. Not bad for the, for the money. I mean, you can use it to go over pre-existing lines, deepen them. For example, on, the, on this collar right here, you see this sort of faint, this, this collar. This was a pre-existing line, but it sort of faded when I was sanding. It got erased. So that's when you would use this, though I would probably just use my BMC chisels anyway, because why use this thing when you have a nicer tool? It's not like the BMC chisels are losing durability. This is not Dark Souls. Yeah. Dark Souls and Gunfly. Yeah. Anyway, so this is what I used at first. And that was also an experience, so that doesn't help. But uh, my memories of using this were rough and messy, imprecise, inconsistent. While I had my order in for my BMC chisels, I actually ordered, not ordered, but the order of the BMC chisels were coming in and I was at my Hobby Town USA store and they were selling the Tamiya engraver blade with the engraver handle. Same price as a BMC chisel. 0.2 millimeter blade and this is installed. You just unscrew the bit, you put in a new blade and this is the handle. 50 bucks. 50 bucks. This off of USA Gundam, the blade, uh, depends on the width. The more narrow blades, like the 0.125, the 0.15, which is super popular, is really, because it's popular, it's really expensive. It's like 30 bucks. But for the all unpopular ones, like the 0.7 and the 1.0 millimeters, those are 18 bucks plus shipping, which is like, you buy a bunch of them together, and 10, $12 shipping. Yeah, they're like 20 bucks each. This blade was 30 and the handle was 20. These BMC plastic handles are thicker. I like them better. And they're uh, cheaper. They're like 10 bucks, 12 bucks. So overall, the BMCs are on average about 35 bucks. And this is 50 bucks. 
and I was I, I bought it while my BMC chisels were on the way because I was impatient and I really needed to try needed uh, a different a better tool than the Tamiya scraper too. So I used this for a bit uh, while I was scraping the weaponry, and um, it was better for sure. But the hooked blade, you see that right there? It is a square cut, like the BMC chisels, so that's nice. The Tamiya scriber is a triangular cut, so you're actually slicing into the plastic. This one, you're scraping out um, a square floor, right? Um, but it's hooked, so it scoops plastic out oddly, and it's just a little bit more inconsistent. Yeah, so there's that. Of the scriber two and the Tamiya engraver blade with handle. Engraver blade is obviously much better. Way overpriced though, even at retail stores. And uh, BMC's is just superior. It's the uh, the katanas of gunpla combat. So pick them up as soon as you can afford them if you're interested in scribing. 100 hours for the original designs, and then another 50 hours to copy onto the other limb. Okay, so there's the one millimeter line, thick line right there, the divot to make an, to, to, to accentuate the, the curve of the piece, and then I also um, followed up on the side right there too, to create that extra part separation. Implied part separation, <laughs> not actual part separation. Though Ravi Pla will do that sometimes. The, the Kotobukiya Armored Core kits don't have an inner frame, so you can't cut the armor pieces um, into segments like he does to create actual part separation. Yeah, if I if I made a hole and tried to separate this piece out, it would just be hollow inside. And all I've done for now is I've so I finished this um, the left part of this, and I'm just copying it over to the right. As I was saying earlier, with Ravi Pla, he likes to be very what what is it uh, methodical with the way that he copies from one side to the other to make sure everything's precise and to the millimeter. I eyeball it. Here, here, that's close enough. Pretty much depend on my eye, I'll look at it, and if it makes, makes me feel imbalance, then I'll know something is wrong. And I'll adjust the lines and uh, try to copy as best I can until things feel symmetrical. And, you know, that's, that's good enough. That's good enough for me. So we're going to cut these lines. <clears throat> Again, 0.2. 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0.2 millimeter, and then the little notch, 0.4 millimeter. So I have them drawn in with pencil. I'm gonna take my 0.6 millimeter guiding tape. All right. I'm gonna lay this sucker down. Just the edge of the tape along the line that you've drawn. Simple as that. And it's just tracing. We are tracing designs. Adjust it until it is where it needs to be. Right there. And rule number one, it does not make sense to start at the edge and cut down towards a bare piece that you want to keep bare. You could miss and mark this part of the plastic that's not marked. Start from here. Raise, try to get it as perpendicular as possible, no pressure, very light touch, right? You're gonna dust your piece, dusting motion. You're gonna pull back, just like that, straight line. Slight pressure against the guiding tape because these high Q guiding tapes are designed for this purpose, so they're thick and they're raised off the surface. They're easy to find purchase against. Rest, pressure against the guiding tape slightly, just to make sure you cut along it in a nice clean line that you desire. As close to perpendicular as you can get, 90 degrees off the surface. Keep your blade straight, dust, and then trail off the edge. You see, that's why we have guiding tape. Curved surface, difficult to make a cut. Off the edge. You can flick it off the edge, that's fine. And what that does, when you look at it from the edge side, it'll create a little divot, and that's good, because you want to imply part separation. 
and you can then follow up on the side and go downwards to create the look, to finish the look, complete the look. Again, 90 degree perpendicular, dust, light, pressure against the guiding tape, pull down, flick off the edge, just like that. <clears throat> Blow off the extra. I do 13. With a 0.2 millimeter width, I do 13 times. Okay, so that's two, three, four, very light, five. <laughs> do not apply pressure. Six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, and 13. One thing, see this, this, this uh, ring finger right here? Trying to cut without any support, your, your right hand just hanging out here and doing this is very difficult. Stabilize with a finger against the piece on which you're cutting, like this. Gives you more control, compensate. <laughs> So again, we just picked up that old piece, we're laying it down. Kind of a long piece of guiding tape, a little bit wasteful, but that's okay. The longer it is, the more purchase you have on the plastic. This guiding tape will not budge when you run up against it. I'm about to show you what I mean. And do note, the line that I've drawn right there, the four millimeter line, that's going to get erased by the guiding tape. create this final cut. Now, you're probably thinking, we have no edge off which to trail with our cut. How does this work? I'm gonna start here, I'm gonna cut three times. One, two, three. And then I don't wanna skip over this previous line I made. So we're gonna create a stop tape. This is going to clean up your lines a lot. But if you want a great finished product, safeguard yourself against errors right there so that when I make this cut, my blade will stop here every single time because this guiding tape is strong. So again, light as a feather. Support, stable. Starting here, pushing against the guiding tape. We're good. Cut down, dust. Easy. Turn the piece, not the blade. Stop tape. There you go. Simple as that. No pressure. No tension in my cutting hand. Dusting. As soon as you apply pressure, you're going to skip out of your line. Do not apply pressure. So many times I've cut outside my lines because I'm pushing, thinking that, oh, that'll help keep it in the groove. No, it just makes it more likely that you're going to push outside of your groove because you're applying pressure. Let the weight of the blade sit in the groove and just dust. You're just dusting extra plastic out of the groove. <laughs> That's it. That's 13. Look at that. Yes. It's quite nice. A little bit uneven. Yep, something's telling me that this is not an exact copy of what we see on the left side. But you know what? That's okay. Let's not get too perfectionistic about this. If you do, that's discouraging. And that might cause burnout. Getting too perfectionistic. Okay, so now we're going to create this. I'm going to save the notch for last. We're going to do this extra line right here. It's a nice simple cut. All we need is one guiding tape. I'm going to put two just 
for safety, I'm going to start at the guiding tape and just pull off the edge. And that'll be it. Nice and easy. Again, pressure against the guiding tape, 90 degree, and no pressure, relax the cutting hand, dust off. There you go. It's not connected to the corner precisely, but that's fine. That creates some visual interest. It's an interesting little space that you have here. Do not be a perfectionist with this. It, it's really not worth your time and energy to get upset about those little things. Nothing in life is manufactured perfectly. We are not machines. We're not computers. We're doing this by hand and by eye using me instruments. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to do this notch now. A uh, quick note. So we're going to change up 0.2 for the 0.4. I think I would prefer 0.5, but that blade is expensive and out of stock pretty much everywhere. So on this, that notch is coming out, it's like a 45 degree angle out of the diagonal line, not the top line, the diagonal line. So it's not going to start here and come out, it's going to start here and come out. How does that make us feel? Looks about right. Yep, the length is good too. So we're gonna first put down a piece of stop tape at the length that we have. Since we're cutting from the corner using the diagonal line as a base, we're gonna not put it below it, we're gonna put it on top to make sure we're cutting from the corner. So we got a 0.4. We are going to place the blade in the divot. You know what? I'm gonna add one more. I'm gonna add a, a star tape. So that when I come to lay this blade down, I don't actually mark past a little bit. It creates a sloppy line. So safeguards everywhere. Tape everywhere. Dust one. Oh yeah, wider blades need more cuts for similar depth. Yep, that line did turn out a little bit longer than the other one. That's my fault. That could have been avoided and I made note of that before, but because I'm shooting this video, I'm a little bit, my attention spread a little bit more than it usually is. So. We'll just have to live with that. That's okay. It's not terrible. I like to mix it up. I don't like to do a whole bunch of scribing at one time. It gets a little bit old and tedious, so I'll go on to adding extra details. Now, for creating screw holes, my design philosophy has changed. For the legs, for the arms, I mean, you can see I place these sort of randomly, sometimes in the middle of the panel, uh, sometimes on the outside, so wherever I thought would make sense. But as I moved on to the right leg, you can see I started with the feet. I was using the same philosophy for placing them. But then I decided, you know, it's kind of random. I don't really know what I'm doing. Let's create some kind of method. So I then switched to only putting them on the outside. So that it looks a lot less noisy. You can decide to follow that if you want. Do whatever your heart desires. Doesn't really matter. So long as it looks good to you. So same thing here. Just on the outside. Nothing at the inside. So... If we're treating these like panels, then you know I'll place a, a screw hole on one side. One. Huh. This is loose. This drill bit is 0.15 millimeter. Some generic cheap brand. Same with the pin device. I got this one because it's got this nice wooden handle for your palm. Feels nice. And as your technique gets better, they'll last longer. 
I was going through these like cows go through grass or corn feed. Place perpendicular. A little bit too close to the line. I don't want it overlapping. There we go, right there. Ten turns. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, five. The opposite was one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> I just started doing 10 turns for this left arm. I was looking at it and thinking, oh gosh, it doesn't look good because they're really too deep and too dark. I was doing 20 turns and no paint gets in there. It just looks like a little black hole. On the right arm, this is the very first limb that I did of the kit. I was using a much wider drill tip and less turns. And you can see that paint settles in there and actually looks quite nice. It's not just this black hole. Right? It looks like a nice indentation. Keeps the contrast better too. You don't have black holes. You have little divots with the color that you want in there. So then for the legs, I was doing 15 and that was still too deep and, and the dots were still too dark. Now I'm trying 10. So I did place holes here and here. So... That's how you scribe, and that's how you make screw holes if you're interested in doing that. From here on, it's just a matter of doing it and practicing and making sure you get consistent lines that are clean. The one thing that I would emphasize above all that I talked about in this video is make sure that you dust. Do not put weight and pressure into your cuts. They will get sloppy. They will get wiggly. They'll look ugly and you'll skip out of them and you'll skip past the parts that you want to stop. So always use guide tape too. Okay, I'm just gonna speed up this video and uh, go forward from here and you'll get to see everything.